RadioInfluence.com. We are back for another edition of the MMA Report Podcast. He is Daniel Galvan. I am Jason Foy, and this week's edition of the MMA Report Podcast is presented by DraftKings. Later on the show, we're going to tell you how DraftKings is giving the MMA Report Podcast listener a free shot at $1 million in total prizes for UFC 252 contests that they have going on this week. So you want to listen up later on in the shows. We're going to tell you how you can take advantage of that offer. Of course, uh, we are going to momentarily start talking about Saturday's UFC 252. Of course, headlined by the trilogy matchup between the heavyweight champion Stipe Miocic and the former heavyweight champion Daniel Galvan, or excuse me, Daniel Gormier. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> Daniel, you're not fighting this weekend. <laughs> Thank God. I don't want to be in the cage on the other side of Stipe Miocic. I mean, Jesus Christ. I, I, the hair on my spine is up. Oh, that's that's like me calling NASCAR drivers fighters. I, I think I called a baseball <laughs> fi- uh, a baseball pitcher a fighter the other day on, on the show on Awesome. It just those things just kind of happened, Daniel. It just kind of happened. But no, Daniel's Daniel Daniel Galfon is not fighting on Saturday. Daniel Cormier is fighting on Saturday. Uh, of course, uh, we'll we'll discuss various talking points about UFC 252. Also, uh, on this week's edition of the show, we're going to talk about our takeaways. From UFC Vegas 6 and Bellator 243, discuss Corey Anderson, now a fighter with Bellator. We'll talk about some fight bookings and a fight cancellation. All that and so much more here on this week's edition of the MMA Report Podcast. Once again, as I mentioned, presented by DraftKings. Daniel, it's uh, as we record this show, it's here uh, late, uh, or I should say early Tuesday afternoon. How you doing, man? I'm doing good, man. Every week that we have a big fight week, I I just feel a little more energy when we record this podcast, and it's something where I really, really look forward to it. Like We've been real grateful uh, to have this mixed martial arts action, obviously. This past week, we had that double serving of Bellator in UFC, but Jason, there's just a different vibe in the air whenever we have one of the UFC pay-per-views, and uh, we got a good one. We got a great top two fight, so uh, Jason, I'm doing great. How about you, buddy? I'm doing good, man. Doing good. It's been a, a busy uh, 48 hours or so for me, just with uh, you know various things that I do to to in, in my career on a day in day out basis. But yeah, man, all good. Looking forward to UFC 252 on, on Saturday night. You know, I was sitting here in the office earlier today, and I'm I'm watching the first episode of Embedded, and you know the one thing that just sticks out to me, and I, and I go. Am I underestimating Stipe Miocic here? I just, I feel like, you know, as I've thought about this fight over, you know, the past couple of weeks since the UFC officially announced that this would be the main event of UFC 252, you know, I guess my general thought has been 25 foot cage as opposed to 30 foot cage, advantage Daniel Cormier. We've seen the first two fights. Obviously, Cormier, tremendous performance in the first matchup. Second matchup gets off to a great start, but then uh, really the body shots in, in the third round really took its effect. And, of course, Stipe ultimately getting the finish in that fight. And I, and I just, I'm watching Bedded and just kind of thinking about how I've thought about this fight. And I just kind of like, man, I'm underestimating Stipe Miocic here, and I should not be. I mean, yeah, the man is coming off a win over Daniel Cormier. He also isn't thinking about retiring this Saturday. I, I think you take into account that he's the, the reigning UFC heavyweight champion. He's defended the title multiple times against, a, like, a murderer's row of challengers. Think about it. JDS, Ngannou, Overeem, Verdum, and DC. Stipe... I mean, he deserves he deserves all of your respect in terms of coming out of this fight with the championship. Look, I know, I know Daniel Cormier uh, has a much more clear path to victory, um, but I'm riding with Stipe in this fight, Jason. I he has my respect, even though there's one major factor that I think you've talked about that could absolutely. Uh, be a major negative when it comes to uh, how this fight is is being fought in terms of what cage it is in. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, you know, the one thing that, and, you know, there's a lot of times throughout his career that Daniel Cormier has been 
the smaller fighter and what I mean by smaller fighter, particularly with, you know, the height and the reach. So he does have to, you know, get in on the inside. And, and I just, I want, I, I really believe that a key for Stipe Miocic is to make sure that his foot does not get behind the black line. And for some people that maybe don't understand what I'm saying there is when you look at the octagon, there's a black octagon line throughout. And so basically if his foot gets behind that, you're essentially one, two steps away from your back being up against the fence. And I really feel that is where Daniel Cormier is going to want to take this. When you look at Daniel Cormier's takedowns, you know, in his fights, it's not the, it's not the typical double leg takedown in the center of the octagon. More times than not, that takedown comes when he's able to clinch, get his opponent up against the fence, and, and work the match work the match to the ground. Whether maybe it's a single leg trip or maybe it's a, a single leg takedown. So for me, I, I feel from the Stepe side, that is ultimately the key. I think another key, for, I think for Stepe is for this fight to be at range. Do not, even though, yes, Stipe's got that wrestling background, I feel that you want to, you want to keep this fight at range. But like, as I like watching Embedded and, and all the various things, because I love to listen to Daniel Cormier talk about the fight game, but I also do feel like, is he playing a little mental warfare with Stipe Miocic? Because he is making sure to make a point that he's not going to forget about his wrestling this time around. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure there is some mental warfare, but I think Stipe and Daniel Cormier know everything about one another. I mean, think about how much time they've spent mentally preparing for the biggest fights of their lives against one another. I mean, DC's two biggest rivals in his entire career is going to be John Jones and Stipe Miocic. So as much as the mind games might be at play for DC, the surest path to victory has to be what he's doing on the treadmill. And I know, I know, the treadmill doesn't necessarily translate to uh, championship mixed martial arts. But I just feel like coming off UFC 241, that was the biggest issue for DC. It was the, the, the conditioning when it got to championship rounds. He got opened up and the body shots were, were there. I mean, DC was able to out-wrestle Stipe in round, in round one of, the, of their most recent fight. And, and he did exactly what you said. He he got there, he set himself up, and he picked up Stipe uh, and slammed him down. So DC's probably going to go out there and out-wrestle Stipe. I, have, I, I feel like that's going to happen. But I just feel like Stipe's a very tough fighter to finish. And I just don't – I can't imagine these fight going to round four and five and Miocic not having a big, big-time advantage just because – it, it, it's not like DC is the type of guy to um, chill out on cardio day. I mean, this guy's been an Olympic level athlete his entire life. So that just might be what his gas tank is at this point. And it makes sense. It's pretty tiring to fight for the heavyweight championship. So I just think as much as the mind games are a factor, the biggest factor in this fight is Stipe's ability to survive and the cardio of DC. Because again, this fight... Is going to come down to spacing, right? You mentioned it. If there's a lot of space, Stipe is going to be successful at range. If he's inside, that's where Cormier teed off on Stipe. With the wrestling, DC is the much better wrestler. So it's going to come down to spacing and cardio. And the one other thought I was having when I was in the shower thinking about this fight, as I do, uh, as I do often, just in the shower thinking about fights, is like, this is without a doubt, I think the the greatest quote unquote heavyweight fight of all time Jason on paper these are two of the but these are the two greatest heavyweights of all time but it doesn't really feel like it, it, it you know it, it felt like the Kane versus JDS fights were bigger in terms of like anticipation and like casual people being aware of it but when you look at the resumes of both these guys and the fact this is a trilogy fight this is realistically i think the 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 most important heavyweight fight of all time you know i mentioned this when i was doing uh by the way a little cheap plug here start a new podcast with pete rogers jr called the fight hq podcast available on youtube also Apple podcast spotify and we were talking about this obviously the the push for the ufc this week is you know the winner of this fight is the greatest heavyweight of all time but to me like when i talk about daniel cormier 
I don't put a weight class on it, Daniel. To me, if Daniel Cormier wins on Saturday night, when we talk about greatest of all time, Daniel Cormier is in the conversation. He is in the conversation. Unfortunately for him, just when he got in the conversation, Nurmagomedov is out here trying to push him away. Like, DC has earned his spot if he beats Deep and he wins the trilogy. But then all of a sudden, Nurmagomedov Madoff's going to come out here and have a 30-0 record. And he's going to be like, the, the, the case is shut. Um, with Cormier, he becomes a part of the conversation. I'm still high on that GSP train. And I think we all know the biggest issue with Cormier's resume. It's a, it's a man um, named John Jones. He He is the guy who is just the glaring, the glaring, glaring, glaring... Um, negative when it comes to making the case that DC's the GOAT just because just because like when you think of GOATs you, you should not be able to point to when he was in his prime he clearly wasn't the best fighter in the weight class so so that's why to me DC's case will will have an issue um, but I mean he's you know th- these guys who you kind of take for granted what they've done in terms of their record but you start to the dust starts to settle, and, and you look at the resume of Cormier. You look at the resume of Stipe, and, and then you just begin to realize, like, damn. I mean, these are historic Hall of Fame level careers when it comes to accomplishments. There have not been that many UFC fighters that have gotten uh, to that point. And, and but you do make a great point in, in that Cormier has had so much success, both at heavyweight and light heavyweight. We got this interesting question on social media when I was promoting us recording the show today. And, you know, let me preface this before we say what the question was. I I consider Miocic the better boxer, the better stand-up fighter, and I consider Cormier the better grappler. And, and Ryan had said, he goes, is an extremely good grappler or an extremely good boxer tougher to fight against. I would personally say if the grappler has a strong wrestling ability, I would say that fighter is harder because at the end of the day, if you're a great boxer who can't get back to your feet when you get taken down, give me the wrestler. Yeah. Um, I Look, the wrestler is different than grappler. Look, rest, rest, if, if, we, if we go from grappler wrestling and striking i mean wrestling is the number one skill we've seen that uh just the ability to control where the fight takes place is like that's that's amazing so i would say wrestling is the most important and my i want to say striking but at the end of the day like i did watch ufc one and uh and hoys gracie was quite successful so i just feel like we got to turn on our ufc one tape and we know the answer to that question that's the that's the best grappler but the thing is that's an interesting question, um, but you got to understand, like, even though you give the advantage to Stipe on the feet, Cormier can absolutely win this fight on the feet. We saw him have so much success inside against Stipe, um, I- including knocking him out in their first fight. Stipe brought down DC in their first fight. He's a big, strong guy, even though we think of DC as a stocky, stocky dude he he still is a former uh is a former light heavyweight still is a guy who's like 511 and uh it, the the size and the wrestling background of Stipe is pretty dang good too so even though we have the clear edge in terms of it's clearly he's the better person on paper in those fields when push comes to shove and it's Saturday night there are so many different ways this fight could play out. The only thing that would surprise me is if Brock Lesnar ends up in the cage. It's like a it's like a redo of UFC 226. When I was going back and rewatching this fights, Jason, um, I was like, damn, I forgot. We definitely thought DC and Lesnar were going to fight back in the day. Like they were setting up for that fight. It was like a foregone conclusion, and then it never happened. That is very true. Here's another question that we got in. Who has to make the better adjustment? Daniel Cormier limiting the body shots from Stipe or Stipe keeping the fight at range instead of in a grappling range? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I don't... 
I don't think Stipe is going to be able to make that adjustment. I think DC can make that adjustment. Um, I just feel like I feel like it's much easier to protect your body than it is to to, to control the range in, in a fight. So I think it's more likely Cormier does it. But the thing is, like, sure, in, in rounds one and two, DC is going to be able to do that. But in rounds three, four, and five, it might not be his choice. His body just might not be operating at, at full functioning capacity. So I, I would imagine that if we're looking at who's going to make a better adjustment, even though Stipe is my pick, I, I think it's more likely DC does make it. Um, what are your thoughts in terms of who's going to adjust better in this fight? I think Cormier has to be the one that has to make the bigger adjustment. I, I still believe that Miocic can fight at a grappling distance and be okay. I, I just think that if he's able to land those body shots, and you have to imagine that that is going to be a key component of his game plan. So I would say Cormier has got to be the one that has to make the bigger adjustment. Of course, the other narrative, Daniel, here with this fight is it's Daniel Cormier's final fight. I never believe this when a fighter says it, even though with Cormier, you, in a way, you kind of do feel that that is the case. But uh, buy or sell, Daniel. Saturday will be the final fight for Daniel Cormier. Uh, I I, uh, I sell it. I sell it like in a heartbeat. The, the thing is, he is 41 years old. The thing is, he is a damn good broadcaster. And DC's the type of guy who he could be an entrepreneur and I wouldn't be surprised. He could be the head of the UFC. He could be anything and I wouldn't be surprised. He could buy, you know, a portion of of the Detroit Lions one day and I wouldn't be surprised. So he's a bright individual who can do whatever the hell he wants in his life. Um, So it's obvious that he has an ability to leave this sport. But as a competitive athlete, I find it impossible to believe that Daniel Cormier is going to retire without fans. I mean, fans, that adrenaline rush, I mean, that's why we get in the big show, and and that's why he's in it. So I think we're going to see one more Cormier fight. I think it'll be a much easier fight. Unless, if he beats Stipe, it's going to be against John Jones. Uh, If he loses, I I don't know who it's going to be against. I think it'll probably be against a a, a big-name fighter that Cormier probably beat. But I just, even though he's been hinting at retirement and even setting a date that he's gone long overdue, I find it impossible to believe that a prominent fighter like Daniel Cormier is going to leave his gloves in the middle of the cage for the very last time in front of uh, nobody. I I will say this. I believe if Daniel Cormier loses on Saturday night, it will be his final fight. However, I'm picking Daniel Cormier to win, so I do not see this being his final fight. My asterisk to this would be, is if he wins, the UFC offers John Jones at heavyweight, and there's a uh, a good amount of zeros on that check. And then once he once he fights John Jones and once he beats him, he can fight Brock Lesnar, and uh, we can we can call it a day. No, okay. no. Then you got to no. do the fourth fight against John Jones. <laughs> John Jones is going to get himself in some type of trouble, Jason. Wait, there's I, a two year gap between those fights. This is the thing is, like, look, if, if he can win on Saturday night and walk away, he is going to do something that a majority of combat sports athletes ha- have not been able to do. I mean, outside of George St. Pierre, can you really name someone who's who's been able to walk out on top? And, you know, and so I, I you know, I definitely like there's things that when the way Cormier talks about it, my mindset's like, yeah, this is the last one. But then I just think about like. If he wins on Saturday night, you know, two, three weeks passes, Dana calls up Cormier and goes, hey, DC, man, how you feeling? You feeling good, man? You know, I got $10, well, million, do- I got $10 million here waiting for you if you want to fight John Jones for the heavyweight title. Dude, I mean, like, <laughs> think about this, uh, the Paul Felder deal. You, you're He's, even though he has the broadcasting gig, he's also going to be in front of a, a, a cage. All the time. He's around that environment all the time. I mean, Kenny Florian made the transition to commentary pretty pretty nicely. And and, and um, I just feel like it's going to be too hard. And, and there's a lot of moolah on the table. A lot of moolah. And, and there's still a couple big houses. But he, he's still got to get through Stipe. And, and I do think that's a tough task. Like, like, I am picking Stipe in this fight. So, 
Yeah, I don't know. And, and like, let's say Stipe, you know, Stipe beats DC. I, I still don't think Cormier is going to retire, man. I just feel like the reason why I don't think he's going to retire is because he still, to me, is so talented that he has the ability to go out on a victory. And again, I really strongly believe performing in front of a crowd has to be a major motivator for these guys. Like, it, it just... It feels like a legacy slash memory thing. I feel like you want to know this is the last time I'm going to go out there. And and one of the most magical moments has to be making your entrance in front of that crowd. I'm looking at the betting odds. Fight goes to decision plus 160. Fight doesn't go to decision minus 210. I, I like the odds to go to the distance. That's what I was thinking as well. I, I, I for some reason, like I was thinking about this earlier, and I'm like, man, why do I just feel like this fight's going to go 25 minutes? But I'm looking mm-hmm. forward to seeing how this thing unfolds o- on Saturday night. Uh, you know, outside of the main event, well, one of the things we wanted to do was we wanted to r- rank our top five fights outside of the main event. I'm going to start with my number five. Give me Rob Davishvili versus John Dotson. Wow, that fight is a very uh, is is quite a bit higher up on mine. Uh, but what gets you excited about Marab and Dotson? Well, first off, I think it's a great test for Marab Davishvili against a, a veteran who's you know obviously been around the UFC for a long time. Can Marab take John Dotson to take down City? Um, if somehow John Dotson can keep this fight on the feet. You know, I think we can really find out a lot about Marab's stand-up game. I, I think that, look, when you think about Marab, we, we definitely think about the takedown abilities. So that's what intrigues me about that one. Where, where did you have it on your list? So I actually had uh, this fight number three on my list. And the reason being is, like, uh, I absolutely am enamored with Marab Devashvili. Like, I know he started his UFC career off with, with two uh, consecutive losses, but I, I loved... Um, what he did prior to that yeah, in, in the East Coast uh, mixed martial arts scene. He's had a track record for a long time. And I just fall in love with these Sarah Longo prospects, man. I really do. It, it just it just feels like well, you go back to Weidman to Sterling. And I, I don't want to compare Marab to them. But I get that same level of excitement when he fights. And, and he really impressed me in the Gustavo Lopez fight. So... That being said, um, I, I really believe John Dawson is an incredibly talented lighter weight fighter. He's just had a murderer's row of opponents in this UFC run. I mean, he's done nothing but win, lose, win, lose, win, lose. Like, he's a lighter weight Ross Pearson. But when you look at the losses to Demetrius Johnson, John Lineker, Marlon Moraes, Jimmy Rivera, and Peter Yan, you're like, gosh darn, give this man a break. And unfortunately, he does not have a break against Marab. So this fight um, is high up on my list because I'm just very high on Marab. I have a lot of respect for Dotson going back to when he first competed on the Ultimate Fighter. And, and that's why that's so high on my list at number three. What's your number five fight? I'm going to go uh, Daniel Pineda versus Herbert Burns. Um, the reason being is like just the pandemic was defined by the Burns brothers, man. I mean, Gilbert uh, rose to get a title shot. Obviously, he wasn't able to cash in on it. And then we also saw, saw Herbert not too um, long into it have a very, very impressive showing under the pandemic. So to see Burns fight again, we get to see how high his upside is. And, and on the flip side, even though Burns is the clear pick, uh, Daniel Pineda is a former UFC fighter, former Bellator fighter, former PFL fighter. And, and the thing I really like about him and the reputation he's had in my mind ever since his initial UFC run is that he's a very, very action, uh, fast paced fighter, man. And, and he makes things exciting. So the combination of Burns as a prospect and Daniel Pineda as an entertaining fighter is why I have this number five. Yeah, I did not have this fight in my top five. Of course, I was uh, surprised when the UFC uh, signed Daniel Pineda earlier this year, uh, especially the fact of you know his last two fights were overturned to no contest due to uh, a failed drug test due to uh, his TE uh, ratio. So I was a little surprised to see him in this matchup. But like you mentioned, guy's been uh, all around you know the United States fighting. So. Uh, you know, definitely uh, to me, it's I'm very interested to kind of see a, a great test for Herbert Burns. Uh, my number four fight, give me Jim Miller versus Vince Bichelle. 
Yeah, we have it in the exact same spot, man. This is a, a great fight. I mean, Jim Miller is going to leave his UFC career with so many damn records because of the amount of times he's been in there. And then Vince Pichel, man, gosh, this dude has been a part of so many dope fights, and, and he's so exciting. So uh, just like you, I have this one number four. My number three fight, and based the fact that you put Burns and Pineda in your top five, I'm wondering if this is not in your list. And that is Ian Kutalaba versus Ankalaev. Yeah, on second thought, I think that was probably an omission. Uh, but I wanted to I, I wanted to give a little love to, to Burns and Pineda. But honestly, uh, Ankalaev and Kutalaba... I mean, the last time they fought, it was kind of insane. I mean, uh, so I, I get, I get what, why, why this fight's there. I mean, the thing is, like, Kudalaba is a madman, and Ankalaev in this weight class is probably one of the more exciting guys. So uh, I, I wanted to give some shine to Burns and Pineda, uh, but I, I get why this is so high up there. I mean, why are you stoked about this one? Well, this is my recommendation with the fight. Whether you're watching at home, you're over at a buddy's house, you're at a bar watching these fights, have have your cocktail of choice in hand, have your food of choice next to you, be ready because this fight could last 30 seconds, it could last 5 minutes, I doubt it's lasting 15 minutes, I just feel <laughs> like it is going to be two wild men just flinging some bungalows at each other and someone's going to sleep. Yeah, yeah, I would be surprised if this goes past the first round. I mean, the last one went 38 seconds. <laughs> and, and the thing is, like, um, Magum, I mean, Kudalaba's already exciting, but Ankalaev is the is the steak dinner on this one. Like, he has finished so many dang fights so early, especially before hopping over the UFC. So, look, I, I, I you can't go wrong. I mean, this is deserving to be a part of the top five. Uh, but once you get past this fight, I think there's a pretty big gap between this fight and the top two. I, I think the only question is, do you have Rosenstruck JDS at number two or O'Malley Marlon Vera at number at number two? Well, look, I I'll I'll I'll, I'll, I'll spoil the lead. I, I got Vera and O'Malley number one. I mean, what, what I have that one one. I have JDS uh, Rosenstruck two. What do you? What's your list? We are on the same page, bro. I mean, look, JDS is a it deserves our respect. Okay, he's taking on a stone cold killer in Jair Rosenstruck. JDS is we were talking about greatest heavyweights of all time. Uh, he deserves to be on that list. Probably not number one, but the dude's a former UFC heavyweight champion. And again, Jair Rosenstruck. I mean, he's done everything pretty dang well except for uh, his performance against Ngannou. Uh, those two guys deserve our respect, but. There's a reason why Sugar, Sugar Sean O'Malley is, is the co-main event. Yeah, look, he is an absolute star. I mean, there there is no question about, you know, with Sugar uh, Shane. And um, this is a question that I think would be good to talk about with, with O'Malley. Now, the the person who sent this in it was more about Val Laredo. We'll, we'll talk about Laredo here later on where uh, Cameron said, the Loretta talk on the Fight HQ has me interested in star building. Thoughts on how to build a star, whether it should be actively done or just naturally happen. I think it's it's a combination of the two. I think, in, and if you watched the first episode Embedded, I think it really laid into of how Sean O'Malley has become a star and why the UFC has put him in this spot. It's effective. It's not just his fighting ability, but it's everything he does, whether we're talking about his Twitch channel, how he interacts with fans on social media, you know, his, the podcast that he does with his coach, Tim Welch. There's to me, it encompasses all things where I feel that he's, he's a fighter that, has allowed you into his world to where you feel like you truly know who Sean O'Malley is. And look, and this guy is super talented. I think he's going to give a lot of people problems at 135 pounds. Um, you know, I, I think there's potentially some bad matchups at 135. Like, you know, Pete Rogers on our show last night, I thought he brought up a great example of this 
Cody Stamen might be a little bit of a, an interesting matchup for him because of Cody's wrestling abilities. I mean, that's kind of a little bit of the unknown, but I think when you talk about the star power of Sean O'Malley, Daniel, it all goes back to Contender Series when you got Snoop Dogg on the broadcast yelling out O'Malley, 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 O'Malley. Yeah, yeah. Um, so making a star is a very great question. Uh, it, it boils down to when you get, you have to, one, get eyeballs on you. And when you get them, what do you do? And Sean O'Malley's just been captivating. And when he's gotten eyeballs on him, people have resonated with him. So he's gotten more and more eyeballs. Laredo's done a good job of doing that as well. And things have changed when it comes to making stars. The media landscape has trained, changed drastically. Back in the day, you could make a star on a UFC countdown show. On a UFC countdown show on Spike TV, you could make a fight, you could sell a pay-per-view. You cannot do that on television anymore. People do not consume media at, at that great of volume that way. People consume it on their phones. Very personal niche experiences, as you mentioned, the Twitch stream, the podcast, and the tweets. Um, that short attention span media content is usually how people become stars because they just are constantly bombarded with it. There's always a No Malley article. There's always a Paige Van Zandt article, a Conor McGregor article. If you want to become a star, you got to get in there. It's very hard for a promotion like the UFC or Bellator to force a guy to become a star. It's got to be natural. That's what we've seen thus far with our most recent stars. So, I, I would answer it that way. Um, again, Sean's a star. He's captivating. Some of the headlines have been incredibly strange. Um, and most importantly, when he's gotten the eyeballs, he's backed it up. There's everyone who watched UFC 250 came away thinking, holy damn, that was a, that was a hell of a performance against Eddie Wineland. Just a brutal knockout. So when Sean's got the attention, he's knocked it out of the park. That's a great point by Pete in that the UFC has got to be careful with them. They cannot be put him in there with guys that are going to grind it and put him down because the thing is, Sean O'Malley is their ticket to a big-time pay-per-view. You get that guy to a, a Bantamweight championship opportunity, hell, you get him in a non-title fight against Cody Garbrandt. That might still do good business. So, uh, you know, Cheeto Vera is a tough veteran. Um, he's been highly, highly underrated his entire career and he presents a tough challenge. But the reason why this is our top fight is entirely because Sean O'Malley is a fighter who represents immense upside, both from a skill set and a star potential. Yeah, it's, uh, I'm expecting a Sean O'Malley win. I think there's a reason he's as big of a betting favorite as he is. By the way, the second biggest betting favorite as we do this show here on Tuesday afternoon is Magomov and Kalayev. He is minus 310. Sean O'Malley is minus 320. Of course, those two could be two guys that maybe you want to put in your DraftKings lineup on Saturday. Of course, this week's episode of the MMA Report podcast is presented by DraftKings. The hits literally keep on coming from one MMA event to the next. They grow in excitement and anticipation. UFC 252 is no different with two of the sport's most respected fighters stepping into the octagon this weekend. There is no better place to get in all the action than with DraftKings, the leader in one-day fantasy sports. For this weekend's fight, DraftKings is offering new users a free shot at $1 million in total prizes. If you haven't tried it yet, Fantasy MMA is easy to play. Just pick six fighters, stay under the salary cap, and pile up points for advances, takedowns, and more. There is no better way to put your MMA knowledge to the test than to compete for a free shot at $1 million. A free shot at a $1 million. Free in total prizes. But... If MMA isn't for you, don't worry. DraftKings is offering plenty of fantasy contests for all of the sports that have returned to action. Plus, new this year, DraftKings just launched Best Ball Contest or Football. If you aren't familiar with Best Ball, simply head to the app now and check it out. And, of course, that big DraftKings contest on Saturday night is the MMA $1 million, $1 million guaranteed first place pays out $200,000 and download the DraftKings app now and use the promo code MMA report to get a free shot at $1 million in total prizes for this weekend's UFC 252 contest. That's promo code 
MMA Report to get a free shot at $1 million with your first deposit only at DraftKings. Minimum $5 deposit required. Eligibility restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com for details. Once again, that is promo code MMA Report for new users to get a free shot at this contest come up here on Saturday. Of course, uh, on Thursday, I'll be live on Osmo with Pete Rogers Jr. to uh, break down this card down. I will tell you right now, as I sit here on Tuesday, Jair Zero Rosenstruck is someone that I am targeting in terms of this. Uh, I do like O'Malley. Um, you know, you're going to have to roster the main event. They're both uh, priced pretty much the same. Uh, Stipe, 8200 Cormier, 8000 Of course, you got to pay up for Sean O'Malley. And uh, my punt play of the week is probably going to be Ian Kutalabos at 7100 When you're, you know, if, if, you're, if you're new to the DFS world and you're trying to build that lineup, one of the best piece of advice I can give you is you got to look for at least two underdogs to really put that lineup together with the salaries to, you know, of course, being only spend $50,000. So be sure to check out our present but, sponsor this week, DraftKings. Dude, think about it. All right. Think about it. Free, free, a free shot to win the top. It's a million dollar deal. The top prize, $200,000, right? You get a free shot if you enter our promo code MA Report. Free. Imagine. You get all the the Christmas presents for people at Christmas, and, and you got in for free. That's that's exciting. Uh, look, I am not a DraftKings expert. Jason is. Pete is. I, I'm gonna give you something wild and crazy, man. Uh, let, let's ride. Let's ride. Uh, I'm going Felice Herrick, Jason. Felice Herrick is gonna be in the winning lineup, the winning two hundred thousand dollar lineup. Uh, that's a really poor advice, but I'm gonna go Felice Herrick. But again, free. A, a shot to win all that much money. Gosh, I, I mean, I, I'm pretty hyped for uh, whoever does that. If Felice Herrig wins, she will be in the optimal lineup. There's no question about it. I mean, obviously the question with Felice is... It's finishing you know, the fight. <laughs> well, A, finishing the fight, but B, also it's her first fight since she tore her ACL. How does how does she, you know, is she tentative? How, how does she look in that one? Um, by the way, and of course, you know, I mean, look, the, the, the statistics on female fights is that a majority of them, you know, go over two and a half rounds and the prop bet of over two and a half rounds for her fight is minus two forty. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Th- just thank God. I didn't recommend Alex Caceres on this card. That would, that would, that would be, that'd be a waste if you put some money <laughs> on, on, on Alex Caceres. But yeah, man, I mean, it's a, uh, it's exciting. Those DraftKings, man, uh, it's fun to play, and it's like, it's it's the it's the one sport where I feel the most confident about it. But it's also the one where I get so angry whenever I don't win, but uh, I get happy when I do. Yeah, it's uh, doing all the the MLB shows for Osmo. I've been learning a lot about MLB DFS. By the way, uh, so there is an over under two and a half rounds that is larger than the Felice Herrick fight. And that is the Ashley Yoder, Liviana Souza fight. The over two and a half rounds on that one is minus 345. <laughs> minus 340. Think about how many times a fight gets to finish, like a guillotine choke, a rear naked choke. But, uh, I mean, let's look at Yoder's record. Yoder, uh, 12 fights, eight of them have gone the distance, four submission. And then you look at Souza on the other side. Uh, you know, that might be a good bet, dude, because... She's Sosa's had 15 fights, but 10 of them have been finished. Uh, I, I say that that fight goes under, and I, I think Sosa gets the finish. I, I'm going, I'm going that way, even though Yoder's last six fights have gone the distance. But damn, those are like crazy odds in terms of how big of a favorite it is to go the distance. I spoke to Ashley Yoder about two or three weeks ago. And like my biggest takeaway from our conversation was it was towards the end of the conversation where she talked about how mentally she's just in a better place now than she has been in the past. And she didn't really go into details on that. Um, You know, typically when a fighter tells me that they're just mentally in a better place, tells me that there's just been things going on outside of competition that have just been weighing on, on their mind. So I thought that was interesting with Ashley Yoder. Um, Chris Dawkins, Parker Porter is a matchup of two heavyweights making their UFC debut was, uh, I remember, uh, I started really learning about Parker Porter about a year ago when I know his management was trying to get him into the UFC. Of course, uh, Chris Dawkins, of course, his brother, uh, you know, in the UFC as well. 
Um, you know, in terms of, I think we've pretty much gone over everything else. Uh, TJ Brown, Danny Chavez, I expect TJ Brown, uh, to get a win there. Um, but in terms of the underdog that we like the best to win. So I got to imagine with you, as we sit here, Steve A. Mioch is at plus 100. You already said <laughs> Steve A. Yeah, your pick. pick. So that, that's got to be your guy. Mm-hmm. Um, but if we're going, cause I mean, it, it is only plus 100. So if I was going to go with someone else who, who's, uh, a bigger a bigger dog gosh i don't know man um there isn't a whole lot of major dogs i like on this card i almost gotta say i almost i almost gotta say like someone like uh kudalaba just because even though ankalaev's like the clear favorite i feel like these two guys i feel like ankalaev in his exchange is going to leave himself open so when you look at some of those bigger dogs, I think Cote Lava is a possibility just because that could be a fight where one single strike ends it. But when you look at some of those closer fights, is there anything that jumps out to you? No, I mean, you know, you, I mean, look, you look at Dawkins and Porter, Dawkins is plus 105. You know, it's heavyweight MMA, you know, uh, you know, but obviously not big odds there. I, I did look at Kutalaba at plus two fifty five, just because I, you know that's a fight that I just I think it's going to be who falls first, you know, in, in terms of those guys. But look, there's a reason Ankalaev is the big favorite in there. Um, other than that, what none of the big underdogs really stick out to me. I mean, like I, I you know, I'm picking Cormier, but look, you know, I think it's a coin flip type fight. I like O'Malley. I like I like Rosenstruck. I like Marab. Jim Miller plus one hundred. I, I like Jim. I would pick Jim Miller to to win in that spot. Uh, Liviana Souza. I think you, know, you got like you like her in that spot. I like her Burns. Uh, I don't. I, do I like, like uh, Danny. Ch- I like Danny Chavez over DJ Brown. Yeah, that's that's an interesting one. I do not like Felice Herrig at plus two fifty. Um, you know, I, just. Too many unknowns with Felice Harrigan in this one, with it being her first fight after ACL. I think that's just kind of one of those things that you wonder. I mean, look, and maybe she goes out there and puts on a solid performance, but I'm looking forward to uh, to watching these fights coming up here on Saturday night, UFC 252. But, Daniel, uh, let's move on to uh, some takeaways from what we saw last week at UFC Vegas 6 and Bellator 243. First up uh, on Friday night at Bellator 243, uh, the post fight interview by Michael Chandler. I take that as see you later, Bellator. Hello, UFC. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I think it's it's blatantly obvious the in the post fight interview, what he's done on social media. It, Chandler's UFC bound and um it's it's not so much where is Michael Chandler going now, it's who's he gonna fight first. Dude. What a way to leave Bellator with that quick win over Benson Henderson. I mean, Michael Chandler could not have had a better Friday night. Yeah, no, that that was a tremendous performance, doing some great jobs with changing his stances. Um, you know, look, and I think if you're Michael Chandler, if, if you're going to go to the UFC, I think it's now or never. I think if it does not happen now, it's never going to happen. And I was listening to this clip that Sirius XM had put out on, on Twitter where he was on the Luke Thomas show on Monday and like you listen to him talking and, and you know, he's talking about how when he went to Missouri to, to be a walk on the wrestling team, how he had family members and friends telling him not to do it. What happens if you don't make the team? What if you never wrestle? And he's just basically like, no, I want the challenge. And I'm listening to this comment going, Oh my God, this is like, he might as well just say UFC come, come send me a contract offer. And, but I, I obviously challenged me a ton of money over the last 10 years or so. And to me, I I just think I just get the sense that he's at this point of, I want to prove I'm the best lightweight in the world. And yes, maybe I do take less money, but you know, you're, you're betting on yourself that look, if I, if I believe I'm the best fighter in the world and all of a sudden I can go in the UFC, cause you know, if Chandler gets into the UFC, they are throwing him to the wolves. There is not going to be any showcase fight. He's going to get somebody in the top 10 and the, the the one name that I, I threw out, there's two names that I think are, are interesting fights for him. One is Paul Felder. How about the other one, Charles Oliveira? Oh, Oliveira would be a great fight because, like, oh, gosh, that would be all over the place. I mean, the stand-up affair between those two would be great, and let's say Chandler utilizes his wrestling. I mean, that would be a dumb idea against one of the most dangerous grapplers in, in the whole damn sport. I mean, 
Dude, put Chandler in the in the cage against anyone in that top ten UFC lightweight division. It's a great fight. I mean, the difference uh, between back when he was wrestling collegiately and now is he's no longer a walk on. He's a blue chip prospect, and maybe Bellator can afford to pay Chandler more per fight uh, on a base deal. But the upside of competing for a lightweight championship or competing against Conor McGregor one day. Those upsides, I mean, those present way more money opportunities. And um, for Chandler, it just makes all the sense of the world. Um, so you sign me up for any of those fights. Put him in the cage against Dan Hooker, Diego Feia, uh, Kevin Lee, who, you name it. There are so many top lightweights who have exciting fighting styles. And Chandler also has that. Again, a part of the best fight in Bellator history. Uh, he is a guy with the wrestling base, so maybe he could play it safe, but I, I find that unlikely. So I hope eventually down the line, the one fight I desperately want to see within the next two years would be a Michael Chandler versus Justin Gaethje. That's the number one fight I want to see out of uh, Michael Chandler's UFC run. Yeah, I mean, look, it's I, I think it's very clear to me that he will end up uh, in the UFC, but time is going to tell on that. I just, I, I don't know. I just, maybe I'm I'm wrong here. I just, I get the sense that maybe Bellator is just, you know, maybe they're ready to, to kind of move on. I don't know, but we'll, we'll see what happens there. Um, you know, Tim Johnson, big win for him. Miles Jury puts himself in a good position. That was a really good fight between him and George Carajan. Sabah Hamasi, I thought, used great fight IQ um, to get the win there. Um, you know, obviously, you know, Valley Laredo is, is a – Interesting fighter to pay attention to as we go forward. Um, you know, me and Pete talked about, you know, just kind of her, her fighting abilities. I, I think when I watch that fight, the one question I, I have just in terms of fighting abilities is, you know, in that fight, Tara Graf did not do a good job at all of cutting off Valerie Laredo as Valerie Laredo was circling around her. And, and you know, I, I sit there and say, I wonder when Valerie fights someone that is able to cut her off and maybe force a little more engagement. How does that separate things? I mean, I, and I said this on social media after the fight was over. I mean, look, don't like when I heard people talking about, you know, how quick she, she fight Lima Lee McFarlane three to four years. I, I think this is going to be a very slow build with her. I think you're looking at a slow build of two to three years for Valerie. I, I do think that one of the key things that I mean, look, and she has done an incredible job of marking herself outside of competition. I understand that there's going to be people that are not going to like the way she's marketed herself. You know, she talked about it last week. Uh, I, I hope there's people around her that have the conversation with her of, of how people perceive her social media. I, I kind of just based on her comments, I just kind of wonder if she understands how some people perceive it as a way of, I guess how she's, she wants to present herself. But she is a fighter that I think given the right ma matchups, given the proper time to develop, this is someone who could be a star for Bellator. I mean, she's already a star, right? Like she has 400,000 followers on her Instagram. <laughs> she, she's a star. Um, how big, But like she could be a, a real rating star. Her and Ali Malay could be a real, real big time deal. Um, it's important to remember she's 22 years old. She's mm -hmm. three and oh, she's three and oh. Uh, if you combine the records of her opponents that she's beaten, it's three and three, right? Like she's she's thus far done not, nothing really, um, in, in this sport. So, like, you gotta you gotta be patient with her because she showcases uh, some potential, especially on the feet. But, uh, for, for you, if you're Bellator. The, the long-term goal has to be you want to get her in a big-time fight eventually. But that requires building her up and allowing her to build her skills and being patient. And unfortunately, when you say three to four years, I think that's realistic. But I also find it hard to imagine that Ali Malay will still be champion in three to four years. Um, even though she's real talented, that's a very long time to be on top of the sport. You know, things change so dramatically. So I think if you're Bellator, it's probably a two-year build. For that Ali Malay fight. Because I, I do think even though they're going to play it slow. I guarantee you. Eventually. If she starts beating fighters who have halfway decent record. She's going to get rushed to that title opportunity. So Valerie is a fighter who has literally the potential to be the top star in Bellator. 
Um, she just really resonates with people uh, with their social media. And um, in this fight against Graf, I mean, she showcased some patience, right? In that, in that first round, like she just spaced out Graf and outlanded her and was patient and eventually turned her back on and, and, and finished her. I mean, it was just a, it was a dominant performance from Lareda. Again, not not the toughest opponent. You mentioned it. The other other fighters would have done better ways of stopping her. But let's make no bones about it. From a possible name standpoint, Valerie Lareda is the most valuable asset, in my opinion, on Bellator's roster. It's as simple as that. I believe that wholeheartedly. And the reason I believe that wholeheartedly is I think she has the most potential to be the most popular fighter that they have. As you say that, I'm like in my, I'm just like circling my brain of like, is there anyone else you can make an argument with? And, and I just, and I think it's, and you're spot on. You look at her social media following. I mean, it's just, she has the ability to bring people to the Bellator product that say an Aaron Pico can't bring. Even though Aaron Pico, all the town is there, it's just that she can bring a different set of eyeballs to the Bellator product. And that's why I think like, look, as you mentioned, she's only 22 years old. There is no reason to rush her in this situation. And, uh, you know, it, it's, you know, I think you're going to see these type of fights. I don't, I don't think you'll see her matched up against someone who's got a strong wrestling base. I think you'll, you'll constantly see her against someone that primarily is going to keep on the feet. But the one thing I will say in watching her post fight uh, scrum that she did is that it is very clear to me. If you are fighting her, if you want to get under her skin, all you got to do is talk about her social media posts because it's clearly something that bothers her tremendously when her opponents talk about it. Yeah, yeah, and, and I know I'm sure all of her opponents will talk about it, and they'll try and get under her skin. The question is, is that a good idea? And for uh, Terragraph, probably not. Um, so, I, I and that's just going to be like she does a great job of marketing herself. Um, I tell you what, dude, you know an under the radar storyline of this fight card that stuck out to me. What's that? Was uh, on on the prelims, Adam Borax was bad against uh, Mike Hamill. Mm-hmm. I thought I thought he lost that fight. I thought that fight was even going into the third round, and I thought you had a lot of wrestling from both, and, 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 and Borax battled back. I mean, to me, the story of the fight was Borax lost the wrestling in round one, and round two, he outstruck him, and, and then now in round three, it was a grapple fest, kind of boring between these three, and I just thought for Adam Borax, it was a massive step down in terms of performance from where we thought he was prior to, to losing that first, uh, that, that, that fight, so... uh Borax, even though he got the win, I thought that was a very bad performance for him. Yeah, it wasn't a great performance, of course. Uh, Hamill did miss weight by four pounds in, in that matchup, so how much that played into the fact. Uh, but, you know, I think in terms of the preliminary card, the, the two fighters that stick out to me, Grant Neal and Dalton Rossa, those are two prospects you got to pay attention to in Bellator. Charlie Campbell got the winner of Nainoa Dung. He mentioned basically, hey, interested in signing with Bellator, but we got to come to a financial terms on that one. And uh, Chris Lincioni, uh defeating AJ Algersarm. AJ just awful sportsmanship is about the only way to put it. Um, I was actually pretty surprised to see that he didn't get a suspension and or fine from the Mohegan Tribe Department of Athletic Regulations. But that is Bellator 243. Then, of course, on Saturday, Daniel, we had uh, UFC Vegas number six. Derek Lewis, it doesn't look good for him for a majority of that first round. I, I thought he was going to get submitted, but, oh, man, what – what just vicious ground and pound there at the start of the second round, <laughs> dude? I know it was a it was a textbook Derek Lewis performance, man. That come from behind win, funny interview, giving impromptu shout outs, and then he showcases his dangerous power. And don't look now. I mean, Derek Lewis has the most knockouts in heavyweight history. Yeah, he's one away from tying Vitor Belfort for the most overall in the UFC. Um, Look, man, yeah, th- this is what Derek Lewis does. It was a fun, it was a roller coaster fight. You mentioned it. Olenek outgrappled the hell out of him. He threw so many submission attempts, including an arm bar that probably would have been the end of the fight if, if the if that round extended another minute. But um, yeah, I mean, Lewis uh, was able to to, to put Olenek away, and, and, and the big ingredient there was was the power. I could see it, and I liked what Derek Lewis had to say about how he wants to get his weight down, and 
But to me, when you look at this heavyweight division, obviously a lot of it's going to determine on what happens on Saturday night in the main event. It, is, it does Miocic walk away with the title, or does Cormier walk away or retire? You know, then how all this going to play out? But I, even though I know Curtis Blades is interested in the matchup against Derek Lewis, not really a fight that I necessarily want to see because I kind of feel like I know how that's going to go. But to me, if Rosenstruck wins on Saturday night, give me Rosenstruck versus Lewis. And like, God, if Lewis happens to beat Jair, I mean, he'd get a title shot. Um, he would. Uh, it's crazy to think that Lewis has that win over and gone. If that fight was so bad, <laughs> that fight was so bad. But um, yeah, I, I, I wonder if we will ever see uh, Derek compete for a heavyweight championship again. I feel like he, he has a possibility to make that a, a reality as long as DC is not champion. Um, Derek's a win or t- a win or two away from doing just that. But again, I, I feel like his pathway to a championship is going to be so similar to what we saw here with the uh, losing the fight, losing the fight, and then boom, there's the big right. You're down. Here's my violent ground and pound. <laughs> if we're doing power rankings of most violent ground and pound in the UFC history, Derek is super high up that list. Oh, no question. It was impressive. Uh, when they does get there, Chris Weidman gets the win by no stretch of my saying Chris Weidman's back. I did uh, obviously a very dominating third round, but it, it wasn't a performance where it makes me go. He's back. So let me put it to you this way, Daniel. Let's look at the top 10 middleweight challengers. So we're taking the champion on signing out of it. How many of the top 10 ranked fighters in the middleweight division would you favor? So let me just go one through 10 and the, and w- when I get through the list, you tell me who you'd favor Chris Weidman against. Robert Whitaker, Paul Costa, Jared Cannonier, Jack Hermanson, Yoel Romero, Darren Till, Derek Brunson, Kevin Gaslam, Uriah Hall, Edmund Shabazia. Just one guy, and that's uh, that's the guy who we saw couldn't defend a takedown in his last fight. <laughs> Edmund. That's it. And I, I know, like, like if you had told me that before the Brunson fight, I would have said you're crazy. But, dude, Chibazian, like, got the hell wrestled out of him. And the thing is, Weidman, at this point, for Chris Weidman, the one thing he's displayed is he has incredible heart and grit because that boy was gassed. That boy was gassed in the middle of the second round and of Mario out striking him. He was gassed, but he went out there and not wrestled him. So he has true heart and grit, and he has an ability to wrestle guys. Like, that's what Chris Weidman is now. That's a very sad version of Chris Weidman. But I'm glad he got a win. I feel good about it. But, Jason, literally the only guy would be Edmund, and that's only because we saw him clearly get out-wrestled in his last fight. Uh, out of those 10, are you saying all those guys are favorites? Uh, I would favor Weidman against Shabazz, and just based on what we saw, um, you know, whether he would be able to stop a takedown, maybe against Uriah Hall, but everyone else, yeah, I would not favor. To me, the fight in the make with Chris Weidman is Luke Rockhold. The fact that now Luke Rockhold says he's not retiring. Yeah, yeah, that's a great fight, man. I mean, th- they're in that same, like, past their prime, name value, doesn't match talent group. And, and that's a that that's a that's an awesome fight to Justin, uh, Jason. I, I think that's what you got to go with. I wouldn't throw Weidman at the dogs. I would not put him against a top 10 middleweight. I, for, for Edmund, I would not make that fight. I mean, Edmund deserves to refuel himself, speaking of 22-year-old fighters. Um so I, I, I got to go with the uh, – I think you, you laid out a perfect suggestion. I mean, literally, Rockhold Weidman could be a main event for a TV card. So uh, I saw that news that he was returning, and uh, I think that matches up perfectly. So, uh, yeah, sign me up for Rockhold Weidman. I, I really for, – for either guy, I really can't point to another fight that makes as much sense as those two paired up against one another in, in a rematch. Yeah, to me, it's a fight that makes the most sense. Let me ask you this question. What surprised you more on this card? Darren Stewart winning by submission, which, by the way, was plus 1950. Congrats to you if you placed that bet. Andrew Sanchez winning by knockout, which was plus 775. Or Gavin Tucker losing his shorts defending a submission attempt. (laughs) <laughs> oh, I, oh man um, look, I, I think the thing that surprised me the most is Darren, Darren Stewart getting his first submission win uh, I, I think that was the most surprising thing I mean the Gavin Tucker thing is just something you never expect Andrew Sanchez getting a knockout 
is not surprising just because it's the power of the mullet, okay? That mullet was ferocious. And as soon as the dude comes out with the mullet, man, there is nothing uh, he, he can do uh, that, that that won't surprise me. But uh, I think the fight I want to highlight the most, and maybe not him losing his shorts, but dude, no, nobody won fight of the night, but uh, Tucker and James was like a hell of a fight, dude. That was back and forth. Tucker, for the most part, got the better of James throughout it, but James still fired up a couple times. They rocked him a couple times. I thought James Tucker, damn, that was to me uh, my favorite fight uh, of the fight card. Yeah, I mean, James, it looked like he might have been moments away from a victory, and then ultimately, you know, the gas tank just gave out on him there. Uh, you know, a couple other notes I'll say about this card. Please give Benil Dariush a top 15 opponent. He he should get that type of fight. Um, Yusuf Zalal, uh, nice win by him over Peter Barrett. I don't uh, – Peter Barrett's chin, good Lord. How, how he survived that spinning back kick straight to the jaw is one of the most amazing things. Um Kevin Holland, great win for him. And uh, Tim Means, he just seems like a guy that uh, every time I count this guy out, he goes out there and wins. Yeah, and, and I tell you what, Tim Means and Loriano Stropoli was the other fight that I, I would have considered fight of the night. That was that was an awesome fight. Um, and I guess even the main event, too, honestly. Uh, a couple things. The note that you should have got a performance of the night, dude. The, the most memorable image of that entire fight card was the spinning back fist knockout. It was brutal. I saw it on a lot of people's social media, by the way. So that really stuck out. But against Scott Holtzman, Darius, uh, what stuck out to me was the power in his strikes. There were a lot of powerful strikes that rocked hot sauce. And that's a hard thing to do. So Darius, um, outside of what you mentioned, that that Holland fight was pretty good. Uh, the two other points I'll make is Yannick Kunitskaya in the women's bandway division completely outgrappled Julia Stolyarenko. It was a dominant win at 135. And then um, Nasrat Hack Paras striking was next level against Alexander Munoz. So in the lightweight division, uh, Nazareth Hack Paras to me performed really well. Uh, he's coming off that loss of Drew Dober, but I thought his stand up looked on point. Well, Dariush was ineligible for a fight night bonus because he missed weight. Oh yeah, that's true. I, f- I forgot about that. That makes sense. That a lot of guys are missing weight, by the way. Just just a, a, a high-level uh, amount of guys are missing weight. And it makes sense. But, um, yeah. yeah, it, it makes sense, but it's one of those things where usually you don't see the guys who miss weight have highlight real performances. Like, I can't really remember too many uh, too many instances where we've seen that happen. Uh, it's almost like you miss weight and, and, and the karma gets to you and then you don't perform well. So, uh, damn shame, shame on you, Darius. Shame on you. I, I, I totally did not catch that, but, uh, yeah, I mean that, that was to me like the number one image. Like I saw that on several, uh, Facebook stories on like people who vaguely watch MMA, that thing stuck out. Yeah, no question about it. Uh, you know, talk about, uh, surprising, uh, items from last week. Didn't see this one coming. Corey Anderson is now a Bellator fighter. It comes out that Corey Anderson had requested his release from his UFC contract. The UFC granted his request, and he signs with Bellator. Daniel, I can make a point of why it's a good signing for Bellator, but I can also make the point of why I think it's not the greatest signing for Bellator. And here's some kind of things I wrote about it. Should it be a concern if you're Bellator that the UFC granted the release of a top five 30 year old light heavyweight. Shouldn't it be a concern about for Bellator about Corey Anderson's recent Instagram posts about the health issues that he had following his knockout loss earlier this year. And, but I think the other thing about this is the UFC let this guy walk because they don't like the, the fighting style because it can be a fighting style that's not fan friendly. But on the other side, why I think this is a good signing for Bellator is you just add a top five light heavyweight to your roster. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think by and large, Corey Anderson doesn't move the needle. That's not the most uh, outrageous opinion there uh, because of his fighting style. But for a long time, he's been a very prominent light heavyweight in the UFC basically every time. He's uh he's put together a run. He ultimately falters, but the fight style is not particularly good. He's still a stalwart among the division. Um, 
So he's talented and he adds depth to the roster and Bellator can always gain that. What's interesting to me is why Corey Anderson decided to ask for his release. Like, like, did he get that heads up that, hey, there's some more money out there? That's a strange move by uh, for me, for someone in Corey's position to say, hey, I want to release just because I feel like that burns a bridge. Uh, for Corey, but I mean, Bellator signed him. So, I mean, it's not like he's going to have to worry about that anytime soon. It'll be interesting to see if he gets himself right into a title fight, gets the winner of Bader, Bader versus Nemkov, which is next week, or maybe, you know, you know, they have him you know, have a fight, but I mean, look, I think his fighting style, he, he could, uh, you know, he could beat some prospects. So it'd be interesting to kind of see what happens here. Uh, in terms of some fight bookings and fight cancellations, UFC 255, Going to be headlined by Diverson Figueredo versus Cody Garbrandt for the flyweight title. Uh, the women's flyweight title online, Shevchenko versus Jennifer Maya. And uh, Bram Moreno versus Alex Perez will be a part of that card. To me, Alex Perez should have got the title shot. I don't, you know, I, I understand why the UFC is going with Cody Garbrandt here. But to me, I, I think it should have been Alex Perez, um, you know. But obviously it makes sense they put Moreno versus Perez on that card. Uh, also, it's been uh, reported that Colby Covington versus Tyron Woodley apparently is all set uh, for September the 19th. So we'll actually see if that fight happens. And also, uh, Zabit Magnev Sherpal versus Yair Rodriguez is not happening as the main event of the fight night card on August the 29th. After Yair pulled out, uh, Zabit uh, wanted a top five fight or a title fight. He is heading back to Russia. And uh, so here is how you should read between the lines. The fight he was offered was someone outside the top five. If you follow my social media, not hard to figure out who it is. Calvin Kayer wanted the fight. Clearly the UFC offered it to him. It didn't happen. And I... Th- my gut feeling on this, Daniel, is I think Zabit potentially is misplaying his cards here. And if the UFC has made indications that they want to do the trilogy matchup immediately, if the trilogy matchup does not happen immediately, Zabit better not be too pissed if all of a sudden Calvin Cater's your next title challenger. I could absolutely see that happening. I mean, that's kind of the culture of the UFC and it's the culture of most workplaces where it's like if, you're, if you have one employee who's like willing to, to, you know, play ball and isn't too difficult, you're eventually going to reward him. So for Calvin, it kind of seems like he's been that. Whereas with Zabit, he's been difficult quite often uh, in terms of negotiations. And there's nothing terribly wrong with that. Like that makes sense. Be difficult. But if a situation like that plays out, I mean, I, I think there's your, um, there's a reason for it happening, but uh, it just seems like my as a beat and Calvin Cater are destined to fight for a championship. Like, like uh, one of them wins a title. I could absolutely see those two guys uh, fighting against one another for a title, and, and finally that fight will be five rounds. I question if there are people in Zabit's camp that don't want that to be a five round fight because if that's a five round fight, the last time Zabit Magomedov Sharapov would not have won that fight. Yeah, I think so. I think so. So that's why I think I, I think he's he's not not too fan uh, of taking that fight. So I, I just feel like that fight doesn't happen. It, it's it's a shame, by the way, that we haven't seen the beat fight since uh, since November. Um, like that's a long ass time, and I want to see him fight. He's one of the most talented dudes in, in the whole damn company. So and he has got a, a lot of negotiation issues, and it's just like I just want to see this guy in the cage competing against someone who's top top ten. We all want to see him in a five round fight because I, that to me is the big question mark. But look, if I am in the Zabi camp, I want my first five round of the fight to be for a title fight. Yeah, it seems like they're protecting him in that way. It yeah. really does. And uh, I mean, I, it, when there's smoke, there's fire. And uh, I, I feel like they're going to make it happen that way where he's going to be sn- hidden under on, on these on these cards to where he won't have to fight championship rounds until it's actually for a championship. So I'm going to throw something at you before we get out of here. It's something we okay. used to do pretty frequently on the show. Big UFC fight car come up on Saturday night. Someone's going to get some chicken wings. What's the Daniel Galvan <laughs> chicken wing flavor of the week? <laughs> oh, guys, that's a good question. That's a good question. You know what, man? You know what? 
We're just, as a human species with this whole COVID-19 BS, and by the way, I live in a hotbed. Like, I live on a, a place where that's on the national news. It's horrible. Literally horrible. Um, I just feel like we're getting, we're just trying to, like, get some comfort. And I'm going to go with the most basic chicken wing ever. Lemon pepper. Get the lemon pepper seasoning. It's the most basic wing. It's, no one... There's not a single human being on the planet who doesn't love lemon pepper. It's the most, like, universal. It's not spicy. It tastes good. Oh, God. Just go lemon pepper. Because I just feel like, Jason, I'm not trying to be edgy. I'm not trying to get a mango habanero wing. Like, like I'm, I'm not feeling good about life right now. Things are freaking crazy. I'm just getting some lemon pepper wings this weekend. Yeah, also, if, if you're enjoying some chicken wings during the fight, you want to make sure you're not having some, you know, you know, sauce that might make you have to visit the the toilet every twenty minutes. <laughs> That's true. That's true. I mean, I always pay my price, uh, dude. I have this. My body's starting to not perform well. Like, like I had chicken wings not that long ago, and within twenty minutes of me eating eight chicken wings, I immediately took it took a poop, and it wasn't fully formed. I think my body has real issues from the amount of chicken wings I've eaten, Jason. Like, I am i don't ever want to go to the doctor because if you don't go, you won't ever get diagnosed. Um, but I, I got something going wrong on in my intestines, bro. Like, I, I can't be eating chicken wings anymore. Like, like I ate some. Well, I still will. Like, I don't like till the day I die. Like, like, I'll go out on my shield, you know, covered in fecal matter. But, dude, like, I don't know if it's the oil or I got a bad batch of wings, but. I was so sad. Like as soon as I finished my meal, I immediately had a jet to the restroom. Oof, yeah, that's that's not a good feeling. That is not a good feeling. <laughs> but I tell you what, I tell you what, this is what I'm gonna do, bro. I'm gonna get a little appetizer of wings before the fight start. I'm gonna eat them immediately. Jet to the restroom, and uh, when I'm on the toilet, I'm gonna get on my DraftKings app. I'm gonna put in the uh, the uh, MMA report code. I'm gonna get a free shot at at a one million dollars in total prices. That's what I'm going to do. And that's what all of our listeners should do. Of course, uh, this episode of the podcast is presented by DraftKings. As you heard Daniel say there, just download that DraftKings app now. Use the promo code MMAreport to get a free shot at $1 million in total prizes for this weekend's UFC 252 contest. That's promo code MMAreport to get a free shot at $1 million with your first deposit only at DraftKings. Minimum $5 deposit required. Eligibility restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com for details. And, of course, if you need a little help building your lineups, uh, Thursday night, 7.30 p.m. Eastern Time, myself and Pete Rogers Jr., we will be live on Osmo for our strategy show. And, of course, you can't watch it live. It will be available on the Osmo YouTube channel. So uh, looking forward to the fights this weekend. Of course, we'll be back next week as we will talk about everything that happened at UFC 252 and talk about anything else going on in the world of mixed martial arts. Of course, as always, be sure to uh, subscribe, rate, and review to this show, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, Spotify, Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio. Tune in radio, radioinfluence.com, and also be sure to subscribe to the MA Report on YouTube.